Thank you very much for the introduction. So yeah, so today I am talking about imaging without the magnet, microwave dielectrography, but also um, I'm gonna give you guys a teaser about the MRI experience, uh, basically building an MRI scanner in an image. So traditionally in MR, um, sensors have been used uh, in conjunction with the MR data to improve the image quality. What we're, we're seeing this transformation where actually we want to move from sensor space and use the MRI data for uh, improving and training um, the sensor data to generate images. And we've seen in the past a uh, great number of simplification of MR sensors. So if we here on the left, we see that your typical uh, clinical MR scanner. On the right here, we have this uh, sort of the ultimate uh, scanner, if you will, this tricorder. You can wave it around the body. You can detect disease. You can detect uh, various uh, abnormalities. Um, we've seen this booming um, uh, uh, sort of, of, of research coming out um, on low field scanners. This includes uh, Matt Rosen's uh, uh, 6.5 uh, millitesla scanner, um, a bunch of the MGH scanners uh, as well, Clarissa Cooley and Jason Stockman. Uh, we've seen some commercial application, including the hyperfine swoop um, Promaxo scanner and Siemens uh, really low field scanners. Um, so today what we're going to talk about is actually instead of using the magnets or low field scanners, we're going to use uh, ultra wideband microwaves. And the idea is that if you have microwaves irradiating into the head in this case, uh, can you obtain some relevant information uh, about your images? So that's one uh, topic that I'm going to talk about. And then the latter part of my talk, I'm going to describe, uh, talk a little bit about this uh, hackathon magnet that we've been building for uh, the last few days and we were kind of in the middle of the hackathon now so uh we called it the zygmatron z1 that's the name for the for the scanner and so we're, we're going to introduce it here for the first time um as part of my talk i will try to address kind of three main themes or questions the first one is can electromagnetic sensors provide diagnostic information for clinical decision making the second was can mri be the sensor for the other technologies and how to design such technologies all right, so somewhere in uh, mid-2017, uh, Sina de Cargani, who's a radiologist in our department, uh, had a talk about MR thermometry, and we had a kind of this brainstorming meeting afterwards. And we started talking about, can uh, we kind of exploit electric, electric field interactions and to learn something about anatomy? Uh, this kind of led to a series of discussions and, and uh, going back and forth, and we initiated this dielectrography uh, project, which was aimed at detecting signatures of dielectric properties or de detecting signatures of uh, changes in the dielectric uh, properties. Um, we kind of went to the bench, uh, got our initial results kind of towards late 2018, uh, secured our initial funding from Google um, and kind of late 2019. Uh, first feasibility paper was published in on the sort of in simulation in silico. And then we developed our first versions of the dielectrography scanner. So this is kind of the timeline I will describe in the, in the talk. And uh, we initiated the scans in mid-2020, too. And uh, now uh, sort of we're in 2023, and we have the first uh, tomographic uh, results. It all was, it goes down to uh, sort of one of the pioneers in um, biomedical engineering, Hermann Schwann. Uh, they basically described three types of, if you will, electromagnetic dispersions that happen at low frequencies. Uh, tissues interact with electromagnetic fields. And at these low frequencies, um, typically you have flow of ions on cell surfaces. Those are called the alpha dispersions. Then we go to beta dispersions. Those are uh, mostly around maybe a, a megahertz or so. Uh, you're dealing with buildup of charge at cell membranes. And then the higher frequencies, uh, 10 gigahertz or so, uh, you're generating these dipole rotations. And when we look at typical clinical MR, we're in this very narrow range. And the question is, why shouldn't we use like much wider bandwidth to get, gain more information? And so that's essentially what we wanted to do. We wanted to develop a system that will pulse over a really wide range of frequencies, capture as much information as we can, and then uh, kind of work with that. Um, so the first initial microwave imaging results were uh, published by Lynn and Clark and was done in 1982. What they had is a, a, essentially a balloon that they inflated and deflated, and they saw a change in the phase and they met, measured it with a network analyzer. 
and they saw the first ev evidence that uh, edema, if you will, could be detected. Um, so what, what essentially is scattering measurements? Imagine you have two antennas, you, you have a forward wave that penetrates inside the head, and then you have a reflective wave that uh, sort of goes back, and you can quantify your S11 or your, your uh, reflection coefficient, uh, which is your uh, reflected over the uh, sort of forward wave. You can do the same for, the sec for a second channel, and you can figure out the cross terms uh, between these two antennas. Um, you can do that on a much larger scale of uh, antennas, and you can do it at many, many different frequencies. That provides you with a lot of information. So the early uh, microwave imaging work was done uh, by Seminov et al. Um, in this case, they used uh, a very narrow band sort of open waveguide approach where they had uh, many antennas, 160, I believe, um, encircling the head, and they were able to reconstruct uh, images uh, here on the left of the simulation, but they showed also some um, sort of indications where they can reconstruct the microwave imaging uh, image um, of the uh, edema. Um, later, uh, Pearson et al., um, 2014, they basically strapped a bunch of narrow band antennas uh, on a helmet, and they showed that they can detect ischemic stroke with a AUC of around 0.88, so that was very promising. Uh, further work by um, University of Queensland in Australia by a Bush's group has shown uh, that you can use wider band antennas encircling a head um, and also detect uh, sort of the, the stroke. But some of the challenges of microwave imaging, um, so it's been kind of studied as another uh, sort of tissue penetrating uh, technology to probe the disease specific disturbances in tissues, um, but the full potential is unrealized. And the reason is that the problem is uh, ill-posed and the microwave construction problem has full, poor spatial localization. And the strike in the US, there are limited point of care solutions for stroke detection and characterization in the hyper acute settings. Um, so one of our goals uh, was sort of to go ultra wide band. We wanted to go uh, toward the magnitude larger with uh, than MR. Um, and we demonstrated the first head imaging results. Uh, and the goal was also, as uh, Andrew uh, previously has spoken about, is to develop a sensor that is very cheap so you could widely disseminate, you can have it in acute settings, ambulances in the field, uh, and it can be used for monitoring. So here, uh, sort of in this part of the talk, I'll try to answer these two questions. Uh, can an MRI be the sensor and uh, how to design such a technology? The goals were, uh, we went from uh, right to left, if you take it in terms of risk versus uh, sort of the difficulty of the problem. On the right here, we have uh, the low risk. Uh, you use the sensor information to classify a stroke and uh, sort of determine whether it's ischemic or hemorrhagic. The medium risk is whether you can characterize the location and the size of the stroke. And the high end goal that I will show some results for um, with the high risk one was uh, whether we can do the tomography. Um, so in terms of ultra wide band, the reason is if you look at the dielectric properties of the head, um, if you look at, for example, the blood, those dielectric the permittivity and conductivity change over these frequency ranges. And that these changes are different for, for blood, gray matter, white matter, et cetera. And you can gain more information as you go ultra wide band. The second reason we went for ultra wide band is that the penetration depth uh, of the waves change uh, across different frequencies. Um, and the fact that th those waves decay at different frequencies allows you to, to provide, provide you essentially information for spatial encoding. And this is just an example here on the, on the right, we see the 800 megahertz, we have the waves uh, penetrating inside the head. Uh, and as we go higher frequencies up to nine gigahertz, where the, sort of only the uh, sort of electric field concentrates on the surface. So you can imagine a learning framework where a patient comes in, you acquire some um, uh, sort of scattering information, you take some history, uh, and then MRI is done. And then basically you train a network where the radiologist di diagnoses the MRI, and then you get the true state of the disease and you can iteratively train the network to uh, discern sort of whether there's a hemorrhage or there's absence of hemorrhage or there's ischemia, et cetera. But not only that, you can actually go, go directly from the image space and then train a network to uh, estimate what the MRI would have looked like, but only using the microwave information. So this is the first uh, simulation in silico study that we've 
formed together with uh, Dr. Adekargani. And um, essentially what we found in this study is that if you surround the head um, with an array of ultra wideband uh, sort of sources and you can change the geometry of the head, you can introduce strokes uh, or you can um, sort of eliminate the stroke, uh, you, you're able to um, estimate the, in a, with a very high likelihood, around 95% the accuracy, uh, you can detect uh, hemorrhage, and you can also localize it with uh, sub-millimeter sort of accuracy. Um, one thing that was interested, is interesting was that um, the different frequencies represent, sort of they get perturbed in a different way. So if, for example, uh, we have this lesion A here on the right, uh, we can see that as we go to higher frequencies, we have more isolated information. We have a higher disturbance because of that lesion and that occurred between coil uh, antennas four and five. Uh, as you go deeper, these changes uh, are perturbed as well. If you go to the other side, you get uh, perturbations that occur between antennas one and two. You can see it here in the upper left for lesion C. So there's very valuable information across these different frequencies and antennas. This is just a test bed system that we developed in our lab where we have a robot, at the end of the robot, we have a sort of a stroke model. In this case, it's just a rod, but I'll show you the attachments in the next slide. And we can move the stroke around and basically train the network to detect the, the stroke and also conduct the scattering measurements. Um, uh, the system includes an antenna where we designed in our labs these uh, antipodal Vivaldi antennas that were very uh, sort of advantageous for near field uh, imaging, if you will. Uh, there's a switch matrix uh, that was used in this case, uh, and then that will analyze on a computer that coordinated it. When we're talking about uh, hemorrhage classification and detect and, and localization, we've, we've sort of observed that as you go to higher bandwidth, you actually improve your um, sort of the characterization of the, the stroke. And here we can see here in the upper left, a, a confusion matrix. Um, in the case of the no stroke, we're almost at 100% for detection of the no stroke condition. And then um, as we go sort of to, so we have these different phantoms, a plus shape, a star, and so on. And uh, sort, of the, the, sort of discrimination is quite good between them. If we just look at stroke, no stroke, we have close to 100% uh, sort of uh, accuracy. Uh, in terms of localization, once, uh, so if you use the widest band between uh, 600 megahertz to 60 gigahertz, you can see that the errors uh, in the X, Y direction in this case is around, uh, the mean is around three and a half millimeters for the sort of the center of the stroke localization. Um, the error was larger in the Z, and, and one of the reasons was because we did not have antennas uh, along the Z dimension. Um, another as uh, sort of interesting aspect is as we use a greater number of antennas, we see a de decrease in the localization error. So the greater number of antennas uh, it has sort of helped the reconstruction, if you will. But we don't know, this is sort of an active uh, topic of research. We don't know sort of to what end will this improve if we add 16 antennas, 20 antennas, 32, and so on. Um, we then went on. Uh, so based on this information, we, had, we thought we, we had enough ammunition to start building a scanner. Uh, so we went forward and for that, we had to design our switch matrices. Uh, we fabricated these uh, ultra wideband switch matrices and drivers in the lab. Um, we 3D printed all our parts, put it on a cart. Um, and this is kind of a, how the antenna array looks inside the 16 antennas, uh, rows of eight, five, and three. And this is how it's mounted sort of on the cart, and sealed. This was the first volunteer that we had. Um, and here on the, in, in the picture, we can see Mary, Mary Bruno assisted us with the scanning. Um, currently, we're at the state where we have 40 volunteers uh, and the numbers are growing. Each scan takes about three minutes. And what happens is you take your S-parameter matrix information. This is uh, you have thousands of different frequencies that you're scanning on. Uh, times the, it's a matrix of the number of antennas times the number of antennas. So that's fed into a neural net, and then the neural net is kind of, is trained to generate those images. And here on the right, we see the dilatography um, reconstruction. Um, this is fed after uh, sort of the, those 40 subjects were split into a test set validation, test, uh, so training, testing, and validation set. Um, and you can see that there's very high correlation between the two. This is uh, kind of a 3D rendering of just sort of using the dielectrography alone without the MR um, 
that's how it kind of looks. And so venturing forward in medical imaging, uh, the first MR uh, image was, was done in 73, construction. Um, the first clinical CT scan is in 71, but I believe we're moving into a, a phase where simplification of sensors is actually happening. And I think much more will happen, as Andy said, in the next 50 years or so. Um, so yeah, a lot, lots to do in MR. We have a lot to do in uh, microimaging. But I believe the future lies in sharing information and taking advantage of these sort of unique properties. Um, so hopefully I, I kind of answered some of the questions, uh, whether the electric magnetic uh, sensors can be used for diagnostic information, uh, whether the MRI can be used as the sensor for other technologies, and how to design such technologies. The second talk, topic I would like to talk about is this MRI for all, uh, uh, where we pose the question whether we can build an ultra low field scanner system in almost a week. And it started with uh, Tobias Block and myself uh, before COVID uh, thinking about this and then COVID hit and everything got postponed. And at one point we, we kind of gathered our courage and went to our leadership, Ricardo Lacanzi, Ivan uh, Louis, and Daniel Sodickson, and basically said, listen, we have this idea and expecting a negative response, they said yes. And so we went for it, forward and uh, uh, we got a budget of uh, 10K and we ventured forward and contacted our colleagues. And at that point, the, the group was formed um, and uh, sort of we uh, combined forces, if you will, with the Clarissa Cooley from MGH for the magnet design, Jason Stockman for, for the gradient design, Ryan Brown here uh, from NYU on the RF, Zyram Githana uh, on the software, and uh, George Vargas on the RF side. Um, we, posted, we created a website. At that point, we got about 70 applicants for uh, that sort of wanted to join. Based on the skill set, we had to kind of reduce those numbers uh, and based on budget constraints, we had to reduce those numbers. And then we divided those into a, a magnet team, a gradient team, or RF team, and a software team. And we had to as we, as all human beings, we like to uh, get some to, to be challenged. So we provided a hidden phantom. No one knows what's inside this phantom. So the goal is by the end of this hackathon uh, to determine what's inside and report to the world. Um, and then we went forward and we started uh, designing the magnet. Um, started by, so the, the goal is to basically make everything publicly available, open source, and essentially make uh, future generations of magnets easier to design. Um, and this is what we have today. Um, it starts from this Halbach type of design, which was optimized in, in Python with all publicly available tools and achieved certain homogeneity that we thought would be beneficial. Uh, in this case, it was around 700 uh, ppm uh, across a TSP, I believe, uh, 14 centimeters. Um, we as part of the system, uh, we're designing uh, both shimming and gradients. Uh, so the idea is to, for the shimming, we're going to do active shimming and passive shimming together, hopefully to improve uh, the, the shim conditions. And everything will be 3D printed or has already been 3D printed. And uh, as we speak, people are winding the coils. Um, in terms of the software side, uh, also we wanted to use this Vetpataya um, evaluation board as uh, was done by the MGA groups and others. And we wanted to um, utilize previously open source uh, projects. So there's a bunch of these projects listed below. Um, and so as we, we sort of ventured forward with the, with the hackathon, we wanted to create a contingency, contingency plans for everything. So the magnet, we had two designs for the magnet, for the gradients, we had several designs, for the shimming, we had various approaches. But one of the main, uh, things that we, we had to do is we provide a testbed system. And for that, we, we used the, the, the MGH group uh, testbed system that right now we're finally generating images on. Um, in terms of the software platform, uh, so the goal was to develop a software platform that would be self-contained and will almost be like you're scanning on a Siemens or a G scanner. So that's currently in the works. In terms of the workplaces, we had to, because there are such a large number, it's a large group, we had to distribute the people across uh, three different sites. So the RF and Gradients team were at 661st Avenue, 38th Street. Uh, the software group was at 
at 30th Street and the Magnet Group was on 22nd Street. Uh, people sort of walk between these locations as we speak to kind of uh, fine tune things and exchange uh, ideas and information around hardware. Um, and if we kind of looked at what is happening the last couple of days, we have basically people sitting on the ground, building the magnets, um, putting together. On the middle bottom there, we see a field sensor being, uh, being uh, sort of built out. And here on the bottom right is the, the actual magnet. So this is the, the, the magnet being built. And that's it. Uh, thank you. Thanks, there. We have time for some questions in the audience. It's fascinating. A lot to think about in terms of your sensor design, you know, especially basically the phone, a phone from 800 megahertz to, to you know Wi-Fi 6C. Those S parameters would be very, very sensitive at different frequencies to loading, you know, around the subject motion. Like, is there a sense of like, would you use, let's say, low band 800 for motion, you know, sensitive objects, or maybe not high frequency? And then what's that lead to in terms of your power consumption, and you know, deposition because the SAR is going to be higher at set, like seven gigahertz than eight, 800. So, it's to be determined what kind of. Um, Sort of a more depth analysis needs to be done to figure out which frequencies sort of are more relevant for various applications. In terms of the power deposition, we're dealing with uh, sort of the output power is around three milliwatts. So essentially, it's, uh, it's fifty times less than your cell phone. But yeah, so that's not an issue. Yeah. <clears throat> Very interesting. Your, uh, you started with uh, Dr. Schwann. And I'm wondering um, what type of functional signals, because you know, these, these uh, ultra wideband have a variety of uh, functional signals. If you looked already, if there are some functional signatures uh, in these signals, it's just, just a small comment. I was he was an external examiner in a PhD uh, defense that I went, witnessed. It's a life event because he basically started. The response of the external examiner by saying the basic measurement system here is flawed and has been known to be flawed for the last 30 years. <laughs> it's a high part. So, yeah, so <clears throat> I haven't shown the slides, but um, we have done functional measurements. Uh, we have not done the ultra wide band because the antenna design is more challenging at these sort of small scale, so you have to go to other high, very high frequencies in that case, if you go to very high, if you want to make the sensors very small, generally you have to make go to higher frequencies. If you're going to higher frequency, the penetration that decreases. There's all the other sort of uh, hardware related acquisition challenges that, uh, that's why we didn't go to ultra light band. We did do um, sort of acquisitions at, I believe, 15 gigahertz on, uh, in the preclinical setting, so on, on mice and rats and there we were fascinated fascinated that we were sort of able to detect changes in blood flow so basically uh, the what is happening is you have changes in blood volume i assume that change in the blood volume essentially changes the dielectric properties of the brain sort of on average and then you're able to detect this but i haven't seen it but I, yeah thank you time for one more question Okay, if not, let's uh, thank the speaker.